what a great, fantastic opening to Uniting Business Africa 2021 and an insightful look into the Africa strategy, the opportunities and the challenges that are there for African businesses as we continue towards this journey of sustainability. We have had some great conversations across the world about the resolutions and the agreements that were made in Glasgow, Scotland at COP26. And so now we want to cast our eye forward to COP27. We'll hear from some executive leaders who are representing, who are representing rather some initiatives such as the race to zero, such as the business ambition for 1.5 degrees, the race to resilience, and of course, that all important Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. So I'd like you to join me now as we engage in an interactive dialogue. We have some announcements tackling today's twin crises. As we know, COVID-19, it's a global pandemic, and of course, the global climate emergency. So to start off our session, I'd like to hand over to Tolu Lacroix, who's the Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact Local Network, Ghana. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from, from wherever you are. My name is Tolu Kwekulakwa. I am the Executive Director and Head of Secretariat at UN Global Compact Network Ghana. And today we are discussing the importance of climate action. We are at a code red for humanity to confront the climate emergency. While the world continues to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact of climate change rages on and inequalities are deepening. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report in August stated that global temperatures will likely rise above the 1.5 degree target set by the Paris Agreement by as soon as 2040. Global temperatures already up by 1.1 degrees Celsius and set to rise more than three degrees Celsius by 2100 with current plans with catastrophic consequences for the people and all the natural systems that sustain us. The Secretary General has therefore called for having emissions by 2030, hoping that we can reach net zero emissions by 2050. And business, business, business leaders are recognizing that we don't have time to choose between taking climate action and having strong economies and bottom lines. On the contrary, Taking action is the best way to build healthier and thriving people and communities, businesses, and economies. Our milestone is clear. By 2030, we must have global emissions and we must achieve net zero by 2050. At the UN Global Complex, corporate climate action is central to our mission. We are driving it ambitiously through the science-based targets initiative. SPTI for short. Launched in 2015, SPTI is a partnership between the UN Global Compact, CDP, the World Resource Institute, and the WWF, World Wildlife Fund. It helps companies calculate how much carbon they must recover from their productive processes to align with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. So with that in mind, um, we at the local network here in Ghana very much have been pushing the climate corporate action across our membership. And we even have an event later this month where we help companies find ways to acquire green financing as an incentive to move forward and be able to uh, make those the right transition uh, to have a more green model for their businesses. So later in this, uh, in this session, you will hear more from companies who have actually gone beyond uh, what other companies are doing with regard to climate action and hear from them what their strategies are. Um, but before we get to that, I would like to introduce Mrs. Olajobi Makinwa. She happens to be the Chief of Intergovernmental Relations and in Africa. She will be giving our keynote address. And later we will hear from Ms. Jane Karuku, who is the CEO of East African Breweries, and Ms. Loiso Njovu, who is the Group Head of Sustainability at Zimbabwe Stillwater. Thank you. We are at a good red for humanity to confront the climate emergency. While the world continues to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact of climate change region and inequalities are deepening 
Africa is suffering the terrible effects of the twin crisis. Climate crisis is placing millions of people in Africa and the world at risk for climate-induced migration, loss of livelihoods, and increased hunger. While the statistics are disastrous in all parts of the world, including Africa, Africa remains a continent vast, culturally diverse, and resource-rich. With 1.3 billion people and a combined GDP of three and a half trillion dollars, Africa is the world's biggest growth market. The continent is brought closer together by the Africa Trade Free Trade Agreement launched in 2021. Africa must capitalize on its strengths and join global efforts to tackle the climate crisis. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, sets out a vision of a recovery through climate action, calling on governments, business, and civil society to focus on three key pillars of action, mitigation, adaptation and resilience, and finance. At the Global Compact, corporate climate action is central to our mission. The Global Compact has developed the Africa strategy to drive increased impact in the coming three years, from 2021 to 2023. The strategy emphasizes the importance of Africa's priorities and her peoples. These priorities are already clearly set out in African countries' development agendas. In the 2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda and in the Common Roadmap for Africa's Development, Agenda 2063 the future we want. Among these priorities is climate action, which requires positive action to avoid or prevent the negative effect of climate change and mitigate or adapt to negative effects of climate change, the change that can be avoided. How does this translate? Let me explain. Firstly, businesses must avoid or prevent further damage to the environment either through their own business operations or the operations of their supply chains. Secondly, they must mitigate existing or ongoing damage to the environment from their operations by acting to reduce or limit, eliminate any harmful effects. Businesses must invest in acquiring knowledge through research and development. This will increase their climate adaptability particularly in an environment where the effects of climate change may already be largely irreversible. Furthermore, efforts must be increased towards climate resilience and a just transition to renewable energies and low-carbon business operations. These efforts will lead to the attainment of the vision of a prosperous, thriving, and future for businesses and countries. Results from a recent UN Global Compact CO study on how CEOs are dealing with climate change, the largest to date, it is crystal clear that the business community feels unprepared to deal with a climate emergency. African businesses have a crucial role to play and there are rich rewards to be gained. They must embrace and become strong pillars of sustainability and responsible business practices. It is essential for commercial success in today's changing global context. The UN Global Compact is uniquely positioned and equipped to support climate action in Africa through her Africa strategy. We will promote the adoption of the 10 principles and responsible business practices in support of Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Goals. The Africa strategy will accelerate climate action and impact through a multifaceted approach. The first one is that the Africa strategy contains a clear strategic vision about the interconnectedness between business operations and the environment, and how a weakened natural environment eventually feeds back into business, resulting in reduced profits over the longer term. Secondly, the Africa strategy has a well-defined and compelling value proposition structured to enable businesses to easily comprehend the bottom line, the bottom line benefits of partnering with the 
global compact for positive impact on the environment in line with Agenda 2063 and SDGs. Thirdly, the Africa strategy provides for an ambitious and targeted growth plan to recruit leading businesses and MSMEs in Africa, accelerate and scale up the collective positive impact of businesses on the environment through accountable companies and chain enabling ecosystems. The Africa strategy is a fit for purpose operative model comprising of the Global Compact headquarters in New York, the new Africa hub in Abuja, Nigeria, and the local networks, including four regional centers across the continent. Africa has the potential to grow to be a continent of prosperous, thriving economies built on inclusive and sustainable development. Africa is well worth it. In closing, I wish all delegates to the ongoing COP26 conference in Glasgow a rewarding period with productive dialogues and negotiations that will unite the world to tackle climate change. It will be an even greater pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Global Compact and the Africa Strategy to COP27 conference in Sharm sheikh Egypt in 2022. I thank you. Hello, and I have with me here, Ms. Lioso Njovu, who is the Group Head of Sustainability at Sibanye Stillwater. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tolu. Uh, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. Um, so just to start us off, I wanted to ask you, what are the critical steps for a low carbon just transition in the region? And can you highlight some of the initiatives like the Climate Ambition Accelerator, for example, that your company has identified to accelerate this transition? That's a really you know, important question um, in the context of, of an organization you know, such as ours. We are a mining and extractive industry player. Um, <clears throat> we are headquartered out of the out of Johannesburg, of course, out of the, the southern uh, Africa, south of the Sahara. Uh, but we are a global organization. We we have we're also listed on the New York uh, Stock Exchange. So so when you talk about just transition for us and the types of initiatives that we've had to undertake, it's been a myriad of initiatives, really based upon how we see the challenges in each of our areas of jurisdiction. Um, when I talk specifically about our business uh, on the African continent um, and the work we are, we are doing in South Africa, um, yes, participating in the, in the Climate Accelerator has been one of those initiatives that we've looked at. And really, we looked at it as an opportunity to speed up a lot of the work that we were doing and find a mechanism to help us translate that into, into, into reality. But in addition to that, um, what we have done, um, I think, is to recognize that, in particular in South Africa, you need to be quite deliberate in the initiatives that you choose to undertake. And that deliberateness has got to translate into execution. Um, so the second initiatives for us that we've undertaken is a deliberate decision to move away um, from solely relying upon the national energy producer uh, named ESCOM in South Africa uh, for provision of, of, our, of our energy. Um, and that decision in itself, I mean, we're in the middle of procuring about 475 megawatts um, of alternative energy, which will be in the region of both solar um, and wind. And in a country like South Africa, where infrastructure is more than just the function of provision of energy, it serves a, an impact purpose and an impact outcome. What we found there is that in addition to accelerating what we needed to get done, it became an opportunity for us to also have multiple outcomes with the investments that we were making in a way that met not only the business need to move away from, from ESCOM, um, but also to, to speed up our contribution towards decarbonization um, and towards a reduction in emissions. In addition to that, uh, we, as I said, being a mining company, we, we are quite deliberate 
um, about the initiatives we would undertake in the US. The regulatory environment in the United States is, is, is very different. So the contributions that you make there for speeding up change really is about strengthening the industry. So part of what we're looking at now is our demand side management and to what extent can we use and leverage the power we have um, to make choices on who should be providing us with alternative energy and what type of substance sit behind uh, that organization. Um, the, the, as I said, the regulatory environment in the US is very different. So your, your points of acceleration are different and must be localized um, in order to, to, to add value there. Um, and then the second part of your question is, is about the just transition. And as I said, you know, I, the inequalities, what we have found certainly, is that where there are great disparities and inequalities in income is where we have the greatest amount of work to do. Because in truth, in areas where uh, not everybody has got access to energy, when you choose to undertake a, a, an initiative that talks about provision of energy or that talks about the environment, your first consideration has got to be who is it going to affect the most? And it's going to affect the most the people that don't have anything. So, so in areas where there are great inequalities, um, where you look at, for example, areas such as Brazil, uh, areas such as, as, as work on the African continent, where the disparities are so wide, your first consideration has to be a developmental outcome. So in other words, you have to be able to focus your work on transitioning in a way that does not leave people in a worse off position than they were before. Because the only people that is really going to affect are going to be those people that don't have, and they will have less of what they didn't have before. Uh, whereas for 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 you and I, if I was to be facetious, it you know it becomes a middle class problem, you know, um, and that's not something we can afford to do if we are talking really about development and about the impact of the work that we do. Um, so the just transition for us is making sure that you are clear on who is impacted by the decisions that you are that you are taking, um, and recognizing that those inequalities um, have the potential for a very big impact on people, unintentionally so at times, um, but you ignore it at your, at your peril uh, because those, those issues are real when you're talking about people that have nothing. That's very good. That's very good. So in a way, one could even say that your approach is keeping the SDGs in mind, especially when it comes to decent work, when it comes to eliminating poverty. So that's so that's a very interesting contribution that you've given us. Um, so um, I would like to then ask you, what are the main challenges and opportunities for companies in ambitious climate action? You know, what we've also found, and, and I think we've been quite quite deliberate at Sibanye about approaching these as a way to catapult our business into the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, so in a sense, we really didn't take time to look at it as a challenge because actually what we saw uh, and, and, if, and even if you ask, ask yourself as a business person, you know, what does my business look like in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years time? And if that's your answer, then it changes completely the decisions that you take. So the opportunity for us has been to be able to make sure that the minerals and the metals that we produce feed directly the green economy. And that's what we've chosen to do. Um, we are specific that the next signaling curve that we, we are supporting is about uh, provision of green energy. Uh, we started off as an organization uh, that uh, mined gold um, and even our mechanism for how we extracted that gold and how we deal with tailings around that. We, we have diversified into effectively recycling of gold and made that a fundamental part of our business. I think we must probably have the greenest gold um, in South Africa because of that, because we didn't see it as something that got in the way, but how do we invest in this 
um, so that we have a business beyond our tenure in the business. We've done that for, for tailings. Um, we've undertaken the same level of diversification in the United States and are building and have made a deliberate decision to increase our recycling of, of, of platinum um, as a critical part of our business. And what you'll find is that, is that as we begin to expand our capability into recycling of metals across our, our space, um, actually it becomes who we are um, and other people we will recycle on behalf of other people in addition to our own into our own metals. So this concept of not trying to approach this as something which has to be complied to, but understanding that actually it is in the uniqueness of what you do that will help your business be sustainable. When you talk about true sustainability, you know, and, and you look at it in its economic uh, context and its economic frame. It is about what is the economic role that your organization is going to play in the long term and what form does that take? So we've done that in the United States. Um, we, are, we are doing that as well in, in, in all of our um, entities going forward. And for us, it's been, it's been the opportunity um, as our next uh, Sigborn curve. Uh, so yeah. Thank you. That's a uh, very enlightening. Enlightening. Um, uh, the the approach to the mining itself is actually going green. Uh, would you say that your model is something that that other mining and extractive uh, companies would li would likely follow or or take a look at? Yeah. I mean, I think I think that we 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 took a decision which we believed was in the best interest of our growth to be mm. an organization beyond today. And once that decision was taken, the question was then, how best do you do that in mm. a way that does not destroy value? I mean, we're an organization that whose role it is to be able to deliver value accretive growth. And for us, that value is not delivered only to our shareholders, it is delivered to our stakeholders as a whole. And once mm. we've got down that value chain, then the conversation was different. I mean, I do think that generally speaking, um, the, the mining industry has really worked hard to understand its role in, in society. Um, and you will see, you will see, I mean, especially through um, institutions such as the World Gold Council um, and ICMM, um, there has been a focus on deepening that understanding, both on the socioeconomic benefits of mining uh, but also on the social aspects because of the influence that the industry has. Um, so what I think you'll find is that most people will look at it and will say, actually, there is logic. So in other words, there is nothing that is anti-business in, in what is being undertaken here. Actually, there's a synergy um, between the role that business can take, still deliver, uh, its commercial aspirations to be able to deliver value for those that have an impact on it, whilst at the same time using the strength um, that they have in a way that impacts more than one particular group of people. So yeah, I do think other people will will look at it and will you know will 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 kind of say, well, is this something we would like to do going forward? We hope so. We want to be leaders. Come follow. We don't mind. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, what is the main takeaway from this discussion that you would like to highlight to our attendees? For me, I think, um, uh, and I'm probably going to get a little bit, you know, granular in, in, in kind of the messages that would need to be heard. I think the first one for, for in particular, attendance at, at COP is about the importance of alignment between intentions you know so you have international and global intentions uh, which are pegged very specifically um, ar around reduction of CHE, ar uh, around making sure that there is there is participation across the world but all of that can only happen when you have seamless integration between national policies between regional economic policy alignment between national policies and what it means um, 
and of course, between what happens in individual industries. And when you lack that alignment on the policy side, so it no longer becomes an intention issue, it, mm. become, it becomes a policy alignment issue where if there is misalignment, you are likely to get unintended consequences of actions. And I'll, and I'll give you a practical example of that. If, 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 and again, I'm talking about South Africa, if I look at the role of, of ESCOM as the national electricity provider, 77% of the power in South Africa comes from coal mm -hmm. because ESCOM is, is the national provider. That has a direct impact upon scope three emissions. Now, mm -hmm. if that policy, and, and it's, it is not a private sector entity, it's a national entity. So, so to what extent do you have an expectation that um, an organization is able to effect change in an area such as scope three, where the regulatory environment is limited? So what you are or are not able to pull in respect of those levers um, has to work. So there has to be a framework that facilitates and that enables that type, those types of decisions. So again, very practical example, but it is the it is the things it, it and it's not a transaction cost but certainly it's a barrier to entry so what it does is that it gets in the way of your ability to be able to achieve what you intend to um because in the execution um the policy environment is not enabling for you to be able to do that and and you solve that in a number of ways uh, so for me that's that's a big takeaway that i would like people to to kind of pay attention to so this whole Issue. And the second one is, is when, when members are starting to think about climate financing and how to be able to apply money to a solution in a way that derives an outcome. Um, uh, and I'm aware that there's going to be lots of debate at COP about the role of finance and should the money be used as an incentive to encourage particular behavior? Should it be used uh, with terms and conditions so that it is the quality of the funding um, that is important that encourages uh, behavior? Or should it be used on an exclusionary basis where if you don't undertake specific things, then you don't have access to that? Um, and I think that the attention needs to be paid to the structure of that funding for an outcome. So, you know, when you talk to the corporate finance guys, you know, they will, they will very clearly say to you that if you want a specific outcome, really what you need to do is to incentivize for that outcome. If you can achieve this specific outcome based upon these specific uh, layers and nuances, either job creation or reduction in all this, then this is what we're going to pay for. So you pay at the end of um, and that structured financing is important. Um, I see the general discussions about financing coming out of, of, of COP. Um, I see the role of asset managers in, in really making sure that the right things um, are done in order to, to encourage climate financing. But for a global corporation so such as ourselves, um, who is seeking growth, What's important is to be able to enable, that finance must enable you to be able to do the right things rather than it being exclusionary. It's, it's, a, it's a much better way of, of, of undertaking action in order to get the systemic outcomes that you're really looking for. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you all. We had Ms. Loiso Njovu, the Group Head of Sustainability at Sibanye Stillwater. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, very much. Much appreciated. Hello, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and begin. I have here uh, Mrs. Jane Karuku, who is the Chief Executive Officer of East African Breweries. So, Ms. Jane, would you like to introduce yourself, please? So thank you very much. My name is Jane Karuku. So I'm the CEO of East African Breweries based in Nairobi. East African Breweries is an alcoholic beverages company that sells beer, 
and beverage spirits, and it's a subsidiary of Diageo Global Company. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, so just to start things off, how is the local implementation of science-based targets? So thank you very much for that question. When the Secretary General of the UN called upon the entire world, companies, countries, and individuals to support this agenda, us as Diageo took it quite seriously. And on a global level, we joined and we signed up to the Climate uh, Action Group as Diageo as an organization. And then we also joined the UN Compact as EABL locally. And then what we've done since then is to call out some very ambitious objectives, Society 2030, where we hope to address issues of sustainability and in particular climate, because in the regions where we operate, uh, our, the, the communities are challenged in terms of water, drought, and even economic empowerment. So from the 2030 society agenda at local level, we are running with 13 of the SDGs and we've done this through investments financially and other. So from a finance perspective, we've invested to support green energy, uh, collecting solar in, within all our factories. And then the second thing is replacing HF4 and using biomass. Secondly, we've invested in the organization capability and organizational resources. So we have a department that runs with sustainability and this agenda. And lastly, every employee has a KPI to meet to support their agenda in their day-to-day -day activities or jobs. And I'm finding the employees are quite passionate. They all want to be involved in their agenda. And then from a community perspective, we've invested uh, from grain to glass and we've done all sorts of things. So for example, with farmers, we have about 62,000 farmers across East Africa, and we are working with them uh, to support economic empowerment. Um, we guarantee them market access. We sign with them contracts and therefore improving their economic livelihoods. Secondly, we are working with research to ensure that they are getting good seed varieties that are water resistant or better varieties that are more climate smart or climate smart in agriculture in general. And then lastly, educating their own capability in terms of how they manage uh, the, the crops that they're supplying to us. But as an organization, we also have called out a strategy that will increase the level of what we buy locally. Uh, our target is 80%, and we are doing very well towards that agenda. Um, and that, of course, is helping us as an organization make the communities where we operate thrive or get shared prosperity with us as we grow our business. So Ms. Jane, how does the global emissions reduction targets influence the regional plans and operations? Okay, so thank you very much for that question. So we've been very de deliberate in the organizations at identifying the key performance indicators we are going to drive as an organization. And we do, we do measure this and track this. And the accountability is from an organizational perspective and an individual perspective. We are also driving accountability of ourselves in terms of how we are managing these KPIs. And in fact, recently we've, we've launched a, an East African Breweries Sustainability Report that shares with our partners what we are doing and what we are achieving or the challenges we are, we are encountering. Now, this is keeping us honest as well as accountable to, to what we have declared that we need to meet in coming years. I think lastly, we do work with a lot of partners. So we also want to be committed to our partnerships that we are doing the right thing and also encourage, encourage a lot more partners to come on board and work with us towards the global emissions. But across the entire organization, like I said, from glass, from grain to glass, we do have um, uh, measurement, uh, measure, measurements of, our, of the agenda, whether it is what we are doing with farmers, whether it's what we are buying locally, whether it's what we are doing from a manufacturing perspective, we do measure our water replenishment, levels of recycling and reuse. We do measure what we are emitting. We do measure how much HFO we are using. Uh, like I said, we are converting our boilers into biomass. And then also we measure activities 
within the employee population in terms of where we are participating. And lastly, I think we measure a lot in terms of um, what we are using inputs. For example, glass, 70% of our glass is recycled in the entire organization. And we are hoping to get a lot more and that way we reduce anything that we are taking to the landfill. So, so I think the, the simple answer to your question is that we have specific KPIs we are following. We have measuring and reviewing the, these uh, KPIs on a monthly basis. And on an annual perspective, we are sharing to the world, to our stakeholders and our partnerships in terms of how well we've done and what else we, we need to do into the future. We are also reporting from a board a delivery perspective, the, what you'd call the ES, ESG commitments. So we have a, a really integrated financial reporting when we declare our results either at half year or at the end of the year. Thank you for that. That sounds very specific and strategic, and it sounds like a model that other companies could also follow. Um, as part of a global organization with global climate-related strategies in place, what are the specific plans for the Africa region regarding climate action? So that we are quite specific. I think Ali, I told you that as a business, we do have an ambitious set of Society 2030 deliverables. And I talked about some of them and they are mainly around water. What are we doing about water? As an industry, we do use a lot of water. So we have a lot of financial investments we've made over the last few years and we'll continue to make in terms of uh, our water replenishment or water reuse and recycle. I think in, in the last uh, 18 months, we've invested about $27 million in terms of uh, across the region, in terms of investments for biomass boilers. We are changing in, in Nairobi and uh, Kampala and even in Kisumu. I think we've invested across, whether it's Tanzania and Uganda, a lot of filtration systems and reusable sort of technology for water that make sure that we are not using or dispensing a lot of water into the into the land. I think the other thing we are doing, capability building with our partners, be it farmers, be it the trade, be it other partners who supply us inputs within the organization. So a lot of capability, uh, capability building across the entire chain. But we are also partnering with government. We know this is quite a serious agenda with most governments, with all the governments in East Africa. And we are partnering with them, particularly on planting trees. I think we have a great ambition in coming years to plant a billion trees across the patch. So, so I think it's, uh, we are clear, resist African breweries. We have a serious agenda, Society 2030. Uh, we are integrating it in the organization and with all our partners and stakeholders, and we are reporting on it on an annualized basis. So if you ask me, are we doing what we need to do? We are. Could we get more partners to partner with us? Yes. Does it need more hands on deck? Yes, it does. But I think I'm quite pleased with, with our agenda. In fact, last year we were recognized as having, as having drive, or we were, as we were driving 13 out of the 17 uh, SDG goals. So we are quite proud of this fact. Wonderful that in fact, it, it sounds very uh, deep in terms of the strategic vision that uh, East African breweries has. Um, with that in mind, uh, where do you, how would you define success by 2030 with all these in, massive investments that uh, East African breweries has put in place uh, to make sure that uh, it has, it has, is able to achieve all these objectives? I think success for us will be when we meet the said objectives. They are very, very clear in terms of the agenda and what we need to do. I think the other success factor for, for me is how much influence we are bringing into the entire ecosystem. What we are doing in terms of being climate smart or, or in carbon neutral, neutrality is that we are pioneers in a lot of the things that we are embarking on. And therefore I'm hoping that we'll bring more partners and more players to partner with us as, as we, we drive this action going forward. So success for me simply is we deliver our set objectives or targets, and then we bring on board a lot more partners to work with us and hopefully we can create a revolution or a movement of awareness across the entire ecosystem about how important this agenda is for the future of the world. Wonderful. 
And so what main takeaway from this discussion would you like to highlight for those attending this session? I think the first thing that as an organization or even as an individual is to be very deliberate about what you want to achieve. So us as an organization, we've clearly called out the targets. The second thing is that this agenda is too big. You, nobody can do it alone. So you need to bring a lot of partners on board to work with mm -hmm. you. And then lastly, I think you have to put your money where your mouth is. So you do have to put real back behind the initiatives that you're having. And then lastly, I think you have to cause a movement or ensure that there's enough passion within the organization or within the stakeholder group that you have working with you to make this a generous success so you, you can join the rest of the world. But I, I think we can do it if we come together. I think when uh, I think when global teams and when people come together to try and do or to do a certain objective, objective, they really do make it happen. So I think we can make it happen if we all come together. Wonderful. We can definitely make it if we all come together. Collective action is the way. Thank you so very much for your time, Ms. Jane. Uh, everybody, this is Ms. Jane Karuku. She is the CEO of East African Breweries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.